welcome to the DL, the podcast show that talks about everything to do with truck repair and diagnostics for the heavy truck and construction industry. I am your host, Tyler Robertson, CEO and founder of Diesel Laptops. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of the DL. I am your host, Tyler Robertson, the also the founder of Diesel Laptops. And today we have a very new, unique show. This one is going to be about how advanced technologies are reshaping today's service bays. So I, if you are following this on YouTube, you're really going to enjoy this one because we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation. If you're on the audio only, don't worry. I'm going to talk you through all the slides. You'll still get an idea of what we're talking about. So with that, let's get on to the presentation. So before we get going and talking about the things you need to do, we need to talk about something that's going to happen and it's going to happen in the future. But I can tell you for most people that are already listening to this or watching this, I can tell you that, yes, you already know what is coming. You probably haven't thought about it exactly in these situations. But before we talk about the future, let's talk about the history first. So if we go back in history real quick, these are things you already know. 1997, legislation was passed to do with emission requirements. And that would set the tune for the next 20 plus years that goes on in our industry. So 2004, we had EGR. 2007, that's when we saw diesel particular filters and low sulfur diesel fuel. 2010 is when we saw SCR and DEF fluid introduced. And again, that was pretty much everybody but international at the time. We'll have a whole another conversation on max force engines in the future. But in 2013 is when a small one happened that you may not be aware of. So in 2013, that's when you saw onboard diagnostics had to be required. And what that meant is all the manufacturers had to put certain indicator lights and certain things inside the vehicle that had to do with emission systems so that drivers knew when there's emission components that were failing or what they were doing, if they were doing active or passive regens and those types of things. But then the things that people really don't know about started happening in 2016. So in 2016, that's when the EPA and the NHTSA got together and they made their finalized phase two standards. So phase two standards really has one goal and one goal only. They've already reduced emissions that the truck is putting out, but then the thought is they want to keep reducing emissions. So how do you do that? And you do that by improving fuel economy. The less fuel you use, the less emissions you put out. So in 2016 is really when they came out with this grand plan to say by the year 2027, for the next 10 years, we're gonna improve fuel economy by around 24%. And that next 10 years really takes part in a couple things. So the first one is actually happening in 2021. That's when phase two starts. And it really finishes in 2027. So it gave manufacturers about a six or seven year window there to figure out how they're gonna meet these new fuel economy goals. So let's kind of talk about the emission regulations and the truck regulations that are going to happen now over the next couple of years. So in November of 2018, the EPA announced the Cleaner Truck Initiative. All right. And this kind of outlined what they wanted them to do. In January of 2020, so very recently, the EPA announced a public comment period opened up. So during this period, anyone from the public, from a truck driver to repair shop to a big fleet to a state trucking agency can read all the documentation, comment on it, and give that feedback back to the government. Now, in quarter one, 2020, the EPA was supposed to publish the proposed rule, but however, things are getting a little bit delayed with everything going on in the world right now with COVID-19 and everything happening. But at some point in quarter one of next year, 2021, the EPA will take everyone's comments, they'll discuss the rules, and they'll make a final rule and guideline. However, what's not going to really change is that 24%. Everyone still expects the government to say, nope, we still got to improve fuel economy by 24%. And I think everyone wants better fuel economy out of the trucks. It means you have less cost per mile, less emissions, a lot of good things happen with good fuel economy. So why is the government doing this? What is going on? Why are they still doing this? Why are they still on? It's been 20 years of brutalness with all these emission requirements and components. So from 2007 through 2017, NOx, which is one of the measurements to do with emission requirements, dropped by 40%. That's a pretty substantial amount. From 1985 to current, if we take even a bigger window to look through, those emissions dropped by 98%. So 
there's been about 20 years since the last set of rules, as we mentioned earlier, that the government has really stepped in to make these requirements, but now they're stepping in again, right? And I can tell you there's a lot of politics going on here because today what we have in the United States is we have the federal rule, but then we also have the state rule of California with CARB. The EPA um, and the Trump administration really wanna make a 50 state standard, which theoretically would eliminate the need for CARB. And obviously CARB wants to be around and make their own standards as well. So there's gonna be an interesting battle that kind of happens there as things go on. But why trucks? Trucks are still one of the largest contributors to NOx. So even though it's been dropped 98% over the last 30 years, they still have a way to go. Um, there's more room that can be done there. So let's start talking about the future though. I just kind of explained to you the past. I explained to you the government regulations, but let's talk about commercial trucks. So first of all, non-diesel commercial trucks are already here. All right, you have mass production already happening at major manufacturers, Daimler, Chrysler, and Volvo being the two leaders in this area. Those guys are already producing electric trucks. You also have a ton of new players coming to the truck market, which is great as well, because I really think that forces everyone to get innovative and really think about this thing differently. And the two that you really hear a lot about are Thor, they're in the news a lot. You also have Tesla that you hear about quite a bit as well. Both those guys are there. They're starting to produce. They've all said they're gonna start producing here in 20, 21, 22, so it's coming. And the other thing you hear in the news a lot is autonomous trucks, right? Trucks are gonna be autonomous. We're not gonna need drivers. It's gonna solve the driver shortage. I can tell you, we've looked a lot, we looked at a lot of reports and talked to a lot of people. If you think driverless trucks will be here by 2025, I think you're severely overestimating it. I really think it's likely a 2030 thing, about 10 years in the future. The technology, and we'll talk about it here a little bit with ADAS systems, which uses detection. It's got a long way to go. There's government regulations, and we'll get into that here in a second. But from my side, just say, when you read an article or see an article about a truck driving cross country delivering something without a driver in it, it's a lot of hype, a lot of talk. There's a lot of things that need to happen. It's it's probably a decade away, All right? So what else is going on in the truck industry besides that stuff? All kinds of things. Electronics are making their way into virtually every aspect of today's commercial trucks that you might not be aware of. So let's talk about the parking brake, that yellow and red MV3 Bendix valve, also called the ketchup mustard valve that you've seen in every truck, probably since you were a little kid. Those are going away. There is now an electronic version that Bendix has come up with. And why go electronic for an air brake system? Well, because it improves diagnostics and it improves safety. So think about it. How many times could you be in a truck where someone accidentally pushes one of those buttons and the truck brakes release and it starts to roll away in some type of a condition? Now with the new electronic versions of this, it's changed a lot. So for example, this new Bendix and Telepark, it won't let you release the brakes in the truck until your seatbelt's plugged in. So again, there's safety things that they're putting behind it. And that's just one example, a lot of the things they're doing. Bosch just demoed a virtual sun visor that's actually clear, but what it does is it shades in the grid that goes over your eyes. That's new technology that exists, it's out there today. Tire companies, they're now putting sensors inside their tires, not only tell you your pressure, but they'll tell you your temperature of your tires, they'll tell you your tread depth, and give you a lot more information on that tire specifically. You will soon see mirrorless trucks. What's happening is people are realizing they can put cameras that are very, very small on the outside of trucks and put them in blind spots, and then put that information inside the cab, right? So not only now can you see more blind spots and have better viewing angles, and you don't have attaching hardware on the outside of your trucks. That technology is coming very quick, it exists today, it has government regulations to get through. You also see a lot happening in the trailer space. So what's happening in the trailer space is all kinds of things that you can watch. You can watch your trailer doors, you can watch your fifth wheel position, you can watch your landing leg position, you can monitor your refrigeration temperatures on your reefer units, you can monitor if your lights are out, your brakes, your tires, all these things. And trailers are unique because, well, they're, not, they're unique like trucks and the fact that you have a trailer with a lot of different manufacturers making the different lighting, the different axles, the different temperature settings, the different landing gear, the different fifth wheel, the different doors. All those are different companies typically. And what's happened is companies like Philips have said, hey, we're gonna aggregate all these manufacturers onto one platform and present it to our user in one easy to see way. So what I'm telling you is there's a lot that's already out there and there's more coming that's being talked about. In-cab gas detectors to make sure that there's no kind of 
uh, toxic fumes or diesel fumes inside the cab of the vehicle are developed and out there. Trailers are now getting mounted rear view cameras to improve, again, driver functionality and safety. Cybersecurity is a growing concern with a lot of people in the industry. As things go electronic, how do you prevent hackers from taking over a truck and driving it around the road as an 80,000 pound you know, guided missile, essentially? Cryogenic cooling systems are being talked about to replace reefers. Augmented and virtual reality training is starting to become more and more of a thing. Even traditional things you don't think of technology coming into has already happened. Disc brakes are a better, a great example of that. You have better stopping power with disc brakes. They require less maintenance and they take less time to actually replace. And if you think of the non-traditional things that have already happened in this truck space, think no further than your running gear with your transmission and rear ends. I was a service manager 10, 15 years ago, really common to rebuild those componentries. You do them in shop. It got to the point then where all the warranties are starting to get extended out. It used to be common to have a 250,000 mile warranty on your transmission or your rear ends. Half a million, a million mile warranties are really a common thing now that happen on those major components. The technology's got better, the manufacturing's gotten better, and the lubrication systems have gotten better on all those things. So things are changing in virtually every aspect of a truck. Right? So I'm gonna give you some future facts. People say you can't tell the future and what's gonna happen. I'm telling you that is an utter and complete lie. So here are a couple facts I will tell you that will happen for sure, right? These are not pie in the sky, these are facts. Trucks will get more complex. You will have more sensors, you will have more electronics, you will have more wiring. They will get more and more complex to diagnose and fix. It is a fact, it is coming. Alternative energy trucks are here. They're not going away. Even with the fall in diesel fuel prices, alternative energy trucks, billions and billions have been invested. They are here, they're here to stay. They'll be getting more and more prevalent as time goes on. The rate of new technology and change is increasing. I think all of you, if you take a step back and look at what's happened the last couple of years, it wasn't that long ago we didn't have mobile smartphones. Now we have them everywhere. We didn't have all these apps and things we can do today. It's happening, the technology is coming fast and furious and that change is happening faster and faster and faster. I can also promise you with all of this happening, what it means for your trucks is more sensors, more wiring, more fault codes. You're gonna need to know how to deal with those things. Self-driving trucks are coming, it's just eventually. And I can promise you if it's one thing we all know, we've all been living our whole lives, government mandates don't stop. Governments love to make new laws, they love to pass new regulation. That's what they're there to do. Even though I just told you we're only gonna go to 2027, I promise you after that, there will be something else. It won't stop. So what does that mean? You put all those pieces together and you know those things are gonna happen. What does that mean? I really think that means there's opportunity for you as a shop owner or in the repair business or even as a fleet, right? So I can tell you, you need to be good at really four things if you wanna succeed and set yourself apart from your competitors. You need to know electrical diagnostics. You need to know emission system diagnostics. You need to get very familiar with ADAS and what that means and you need to be a maintenance expert. And all of these things go back to the leading principle. You need to provide value to your clients. That client could be your own owner that you're working on his trucks in your shop. It could be an independent shop owner, a mobile guy. You need to be the expert. Shops that can properly diagnose and repair trucks win, and they win very, very big through this technical revolution that's happening. You don't want to be the guy with the parts can and just throwing parts at a truck and telling your customer you're not quite sure, because I guarantee you if you do that once or twice to him, he's probably not coming back to you the next time he's bringing his truck somewhere else. You need to get ahead of it. So let's talk about all these. And I'm gonna give you some facts and figures here. So we work really well with David. He is the uh, CEO over at a company called Today's Class. They have this great mobile app. They have an online learning platform, but they have a great mobile app where technicians do these five, 10, 15 minute training and quest questions and quizzes every day on their mobile phone. So with that, he gets a ton of information. And I'm gonna give you some stats here. Um, first, the things I know. First of all, we have our own in-house training class. It's a hands-on course, half half lecture, half lab. We give a pretest to our students. Actually, I think we even stopped doing this because it wasn't really helping. But 90% of our students would fail that first pretest we would get them to come in. These are not people that uh, are coming out of school. These are experienced technicians that have been doing it for a while. They're coming to our electrical diagnostic class and we're finding 90% of them can't pass some 101 questions. And I'm gonna give you some examples, some questions here as well. But not only that, but using today's classes information, 
There are other areas they find severely lacking. So example, this one shocked me. The safety category, only 52% of all the students that go through that class have the knowledge to pass that, right? So about half of them don't even have basic safety knowledge. HVAC, it's about 63% have the, uh, have the knowledge. Suspension, 60%. Air brakes, 77. Electrical, 70%. So what you can say is on average, what we see with the data is diesel technicians have less than 80% of the knowledge that they need to have in key areas when it comes to diagnosing and repairing today's commercial trucks. We can also dig a little bit deeper into that data. So if we're looking at just electrical, we can also go get really granular and say, what percentage of questions can technicians answer on certain things? Uh, so for example, circuit, uh, circuit requirements, right? How do circuits work? They basically are about 75% technicians can answer those questions properly. Electrical schematics, only about 60% of technicians can answer an electrical schematic question properly. And I could go on and on through the stats. Some of these are really low. Amazingly, one of the ones they answer the worst on is actually what all the little symbols mean up on the, up on the wiring schematics that they're viewing. And at the end of the day, this all goes back to diagnostics. Only about 50% of technicians that have gone through today's classes, quizzes, and tests, and there's been tens and tens of thousands of them, can answer electrical diagnostic questions correctly. So we take all that data and we kind of know, and I think you know it too as well out there, people don't really know electrical. It's a big mystery to a lot of technicians. They stumble through it. It leads to long repair times and misdiagnostics. Uh, and again, to kind of reiterate some of the percentages there, uh, for example, this is some questions off of right off of today's class data. Which symbol represents a bulb in electrical schematic? And then the answers were, you know, select all that apply and there's like four or five there. Only 50% of the students that got that question answer it correctly. What does voltage equal? Only 57% of the technicians that took that test answered that question correctly. And what is the correct definition of voltage? Again, very similar uh, question. And that question, only 63% of the time, technicians are able to answer that question successfully. So these are things that everyone really needs to know today, and it's gonna get more critical as they need to know going forward. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ask you three questions, and I want you to answer these in your head. And I also want you to kind of remember them. I mean, if you need to kind of rewind this thing to, to listen to them again, I'd like you to ask your technicians. Ask some of your better technicians and some of your mediocre ones and some of your low performers and see what they, see what they say. But these are things that every technician should know when it comes to diagnosing a truck. And these are basic one-on-one things. So question number one, what is the difference between an open circuit and a short circuit? All right, so hopefully you have the answer in your head there. And I can tell you what the answer is. An open circuit allows no amperage to flow. A short circuit allows high or unintended amperage to flow in the circuit. That's question number one to ask your technicians. Question number two, what would a reading of 0.1 ohms between two conductors mean? All right, if you get the blank look from your technicians and you ask this question, they probably need a little bit of training. But the answer would be a short circuit or good continuity between the conductors. An acceptable range is actually zero to 0.2 ohms is the, the correct uh, range in that situation. So the third and final quest, question you should be asking your technicians, what is a load test and why do you need to do this? All right, the answer is that multimeters don't draw a lot of amperage through it when performing continuity or voltage tests. If a wiring is passing other tests, you typically then would use a load test. Your technicians need to know these things. So if they don't know these things, what can they do? Well, first of all, the good news is there's a ton of free resources out there for you. If you're watching on the video, um, you'll see we have a list of a bunch of different logos. I'm sure I'll hear from somebody because we probably didn't get permission to use all these logos, but these are all companies that are offering you absolutely free training. They're not all electrical. Some of them are more suspension or more air brakes or whatever it is, but these are all 100% free. If you wanna get the entire list, just simply Google diesel laptops free training. It'll show up the number one or number two result right on Google. You can click on it. It'll bring you to a page where we have all these out in detail with links right to their websites and explain what the courses are and what they have to offer. 
Uh, another great platform that's out there, not just for electrical, but for everything, and it's not industry related, it's called Allison, and that's A-L-I-S-O-N, not the two L's like we see in our industry usually with the Allison transmissions. So this is different. This is Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N. Just Google Allison Training, and you will find this company. They have a great platform. It's 100% free, as long as you don't mind viewing a bunch of ads or some pop-ups that walk you through all the different training courses that are available. And they have a ton of them. And again, there's free and there's paid versions, that whole thing. But the free ones are very, very good. So what do you want to do beyond free training? You want to go a little bit harder, a little bit more in depth. There are resources available to you. So I'm going to give you five. Number one, your local community colleges or your technical colleges. They typically have electrical courses that are hands-on that you can send anybody to. There are online courses as well. I just mentioned Allison has some paid ones. Some of those OEMs and some of those free ones that I mentioned earlier also have some. Diesel laptops, we do have training centers throughout the United States. We're in South Carolina, Florida, Ohio, Michigan. We're in Kansas City. We'll be in, we'll be in Texas soon. And we're opening up on the West Coast as well out in California. All that a little derailed with the current environment going on with the coronavirus, but we'll be there as well. And then the other one's today's class. So I mentioned their mobile app that they have with the testing on there. They have a great curriculum that goes through and talks about all that stuff as well for continuing education. So if you're interested in any of these, just simply Google diesel laptops training. You'll find us on the web pretty easy. Otherwise, it's training.diesellaptops.com. So training and on electrical, let's talk about the next really big one, and that's after treatment. We've all been living and breathing this since 2007, but I want to put some numbers uh, to it for you. And I really should say 2004 with the whole EGR. So let's just talk about some of the numbers and how, how big is this? What is the opportunity there? That's always the first thing. I am a data guy. I like to look at the numbers. I like to know and see that in front of me. So first of all, uh, again, if you're watching the video, we have a complete bar chart here on the number of trucks sold each other by the big, call them the big six manufacturers of trucks, Freightliner, International, Kenworth, Mack, Peterbilt, and Volvo. So these guys, when you put it together on an average year, release somewhere around 175,000 to 200,000 commercial trucks. So what does that mean? What it means is there are literally over 2.2 million class eight trucks in the United States running diesel particulate filters today. Throw in EGR valves and there's another couple hundred thousand there easily. But that's just the on-highway commercial truck market. What about the other markets? Well, we do know some things for sure that we've been able to resource and research and find out. So first of all, medium duty diesel engines, there's around 600,000 medium duty diesel engines produced every year in the United States. These are used in the Ford Chevy Dodges. They're used in other applications as well, like school buses, smaller commercial trucks, um, littler, littler things, but they're out there. They're 600,000. Last year, which is a record year for class eight truck sales. Um, well, actually if you look at 2018 and 2015, it was about 250,000. Commercial trucks, are dwarfed by the medium duty diesel market. Buses and RVs, we don't know how many of those medium duties go into buses and RVs, but it's a big, a big portion of them. You got your school bus market, you have your commercial bus market, there's a lot out there. And then the big one a lot of people don't realize is the off highway market. So as many diesel engines are traveling up and down the road, multiply that by about a factor of five to figure out how many diesel engines are produced globally for the off highway market in a year. All right, so in a year, you have about 1.1 million off-highway diesel engines that are produced around the globe. In 2017, the USA itself produced 890,000 diesel engines. Now keep in mind, some of that's off-highway, some of that's on-highway, some of these stats kind of meld into each other. But in 2018, 21% of the engines that Cummins produced were for off-highway engines. So there is a huge, huge, huge world out there of engines, diesel engines running around with diesel particulate filters that will need some type of service and maintenance and repairs on them. It could be on highway, could be in school buses, could be in medium duty, could be anywhere. So to really be good at after treatment, I believe it's really a four piece puzzle. It's maintenance, it's being properly trained, it's diagnostic tools and it's repair. So let's talk about all four of those aspects together. But before I do that, I'm gonna throw out a pop quiz. I got a couple of these and I'm doing all these to prove a point with you. So follow along with me here if you don't mind. On a long haul 2018 Peterbilt 
with an MX-13 Packard engine, how often should the DPF be cleaned and the DEF filter replaced? And I'm gonna give you a couple answers here. Answer A, 300,000. Answer B, once a year. Answer C, half a million. And answer D, 200,000. So again, A, 300,000, B, once a year, C, 500,000, D, 200,000 on a 2018 Peterbilt with a Packard MX long haul. And what is the answer? Well, I want to do this to prove a point, as I said earlier. So when that ISX engine first came out in 2007 through nine, let's take a look at that one. They recommended every 250,000 miles to get your uh, filter, to get your DPF cleaned and inspected and baked and, and do all those things. Through the 2010 years, which is the CM2250, they lowered it to 200,000. In the 2013 through 2018, they did change it to, or they left it the same at 200,000. And so if you answered that question, the 200,000, that was the absolute correct answer. But I got a feeling a lot of you got lucky if you answered that one, because you could have easily guessed the 250 or 300,000. And more importantly, with the X15 engine that's out now, that thing can actually go up to 600,000 miles before it needs those services. So before the X15, it was really a set schedule on how many hours, there's a table you use, right, on hours and miles and application that you were in. With the X15, it's more computer controlled and they're figuring out the calculations for you. And that, that is really a range that could go up to 600,000 and it could be a lot lower than that based on your application. But all that aside, I'm trying to prove the point that not everybody knows how often you should do these things and it changes based on not only the model of the engine, but the year of the engine as well. So we created a table on our website. If you Google diesel, diesel laptops after treatment intervals, we have a complete table of every possible major make an application on how long those intervals should be. And I want to also be clear that the intervals change. They change because sometimes the OEMs will say, well, we just need to clean it. Sometimes they say you need to inspect the DPF. Some of them will actually recommend doing a cleaning or even replacing your after treatment injector as well. You have DEF filter replacement considerations, and some OEMs have ignition electrodes that need to get cleaned or replaced as well. So you can't just take a swipe at it and say, everybody needs to get all their DPFs cleaned every quarter million miles. There are some generalities you can make, but just note that it does change and you need to become the expert because as a shop manager and maintenance provider, you need to be telling your customers when they need to be doing their things. Preventive maintenance leads to reduced downtime, which leads to reduced expenses. It's in everyone's best interest, including your own as a shop manager or fleet manager. Your job's not just to fix the stuff, your job's to help prevent your customers from having those problems to begin with. So let's do another quiz. You have a driver who comes into the shop and says, my truck's been doing frequent stationary regens. Let's say he's been doing them every other day. You've checked codes, you don't see really anything logged for emission codes, but you do see a couple other inactive ones, all right, not emission related. Then none of, nothing really points to any particular problem. What would be the first three things you would do in this case, all right? So in this case, would you A, look at other inactive codes to see what they are? Would you B, check all the fluid levels? C, pull the DPF filter off and see what it looks like? Would you D, go check all the sensor readings to make sure they're accurate? Would you E, inspect the truck for intake or exhaust leaks? Or would you just say, and I, I hope to God nobody actually does this, say, screw it, I'm just deleting the emission system, it's a headache and I'm, I'm not gonna do this anymore, right? And there's probably some other things you guys would do as well. So let's talk about the answers here. And I can tell you the answers really are A, look at other inactive codes, B, check all the fluid levels, and E, inspect the truck for exhaust or intake leaks. And we really hone in on those three because A, they don't take much time, B, they're common reasons people do have emission problems, and C, it eliminates a lot of possible issues at the same time. So let's start with the fault codes. Why do we talk about this? And I'm gonna give you an example here. An example is a Cummins engine with a code 122 for an intake manifold pressure sensor circuit. And you know, a lot of times people will kind of focus on the emission codes and not realize a lot of other codes cause D rates. So this is for your intake manifold pressure. And if you really read into the repair information for that code 122, you will specifically see in the repair information where it'll tell you your def, your diesel exhaust fluid injection in the after treatment system is disabled. 
Active and stationary regenerations of the DPF will be disabled. EGR valve operation will be disabled. And if the engine is operated for an extended period of time with this fault code, we're gonna reduce your torque, which is basically derating your engine. So yes, a fault code for a intake manifold pressure sensor can easily show how you will derate your engine and cause you to have frequent regens or not regens at all. So what we'd always try to tell people is don't start with the derate disable codes. Those are the results. You don't go to a doctor because you have a cough. You go to the doctor because you have a reason that's causing the cough. And we say the same thing with fault codes and emission problems. Go to the component that's causing the code. Don't go to the derate codes. The reason for the exhaust inspection is really that it is a quick, easy thing you can do to look for suit that's happening. So when there's exhaust that leaves your exhaust system, it means your system's not open properly. You need to have heat in your system in order for your after treatment system to work properly. And the results can be upstream or downstream. They can be in either place. You need to look at all of them. Quick, simple, walk around with a flashlight, look for those exhaust leaks. The other thing we see missed use is regens. So we often see customers that call into our tech support or just do a regen, clear the codes, the truck runs great. However, they're missing a huge opportunity. And the opportunity is when any software, OEM or aftermarket is doing those regen commands, you wanna watch the bar charts that are happening on those things. Because depending on what those temperatures do and what the curves look like, it can easily tell you if you have a SCR related problem, you got a DPF problem, you have a dock problem. They will tell you if you know how to read those. Go through some classes, read some manuals. You will learn how to be much better at diagnosing trucks if you do those things. So going on the training side, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions here that you need to ask your technicians. And again, if your technicians can't answer these questions or give you that blank look, we probably need to have a conversation. You need to get some training. So question number one, what are the basic steps to troubleshoot an emissions problem? If they can't go back to the three things I just mentioned, they really need to get some training. What should you be looking for when watching the graphs on a DPF regen? Your technician should be able to tell you what they're looking at and when things should invert and when, what they need to know to do that. What could cause a frequent regen on a truck? You'd be surprised how many things can cause a frequent regen. As simple as an oil leak getting into your intake system can cause a frequent regen on your truck. You need to know what those reasons are and what to look for. And then the other one is you need to know how to test your, D your DEF, your diesel exhaust fluid. If you don't know how to test with an electronic refractometer or a manual one, or your technicians don't even have those tools, that's a basic one-on-one -on -one test that needs to be done with today's current trucks when it comes to after treatment issues. So the one I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking on because we have a whole nother uh, presentations we've done on this is your diagnostic tool. You need to have a proper diagnostic tool when it comes to after treatment systems. You have two options, OEM and aftermarket. You really need to look at a couple things. You need to look at upfront price, functionality. Are the fees for this tool required or optional? What do I lose if I don't pay that fee? What kind of support do I get? What kind of repair information do I get? And what kind of training do I get, not only on the tool, but as a diesel technician as well? So if you're interested in watching a webinar where we compare every single possible diagnostic tool that exists, just Google diesel laptops tool time, and you will learn about all these different tools that are out there. So the other opportunity is on the repair side. So if you're good at the diagnostics and you have the training and you have the right tools, then you get into the repair side of things. So let's talk about an opportunity I think a lot of shops and fleets are missing out on. And that's how do you clean your DPS and your docks? And again, we'll do a pop quiz here. So answer A, you have your own cleaning equipment, right? You have your own machines, your professional level machines that have it. B, we send them out to another company. C, we use shop air to clean them out and someone just manually blows it out with, a, with an air gun. Or D, we use a pressure washer to clean them out. So what I don't wanna see is when you, when you answer that question, and you don't need to answer me, right? But I hope nobody's using a pressure washer to clean them out. Doing so, does it clean it out? Absolutely. But are you getting it completely dry when you're done? Probably not. And then B, when you're using that pressure washer, you are removing some of the precious materials that are inside those, those items that are gonna definitely reduce the longevity of that filter and the reliability of it as well. So let's talk about buying your own equipment. 
And typically over 70% of companies send out their DPFs or docs. They don't do them in-house. They send them somewhere else. Cleaning prices range typically in the market anywhere from $100 to $700. But have you thought about buying your own equipment to do it yourself? And that is a real option for a lot of people out there. So let's just walk through the numbers on buying your own cleaning equipment. And let's say you need four pieces. You need an inspection table. You need a weighing station. You need a machine that blows air through it. And then you need a baking machine that actually can heat them up as well. So there's options that range all over the board. Uh, one of our partners, Redline Emission Products, they do sell a filter therm line that they manufacture and list price on all those four pieces is $55,000. So let's just do some math real quick to see how this works out. Let's assume you pay MSRP, um, which includes the freight. And by the way, I'm thinking you guys can probably negotiate better than MSRP price. Let's assume you have okay credit, not great, not horrible. Let's assume you do a four year lease. And the numbers, the way that numbers and the math works out is you could lease that entire product line for about 1400 bucks a month. Now, if your shop charges, what should we consider an average of about $250 per cleaning? And that's just for the DPF, not even the dock or baking it. And you only clean two a week that generates $2,000 in revenue for your shop. Now you're spending 1400, you're collecting 2000, you're on the right side of it very quickly. And by the way, those numbers get remarkably well very quick if you can do more than two DPF or dock cleans a week and you have better credit or you go longer terms than four years. You can get that monthly payment number way, way down while driving extra revenue to your shop. The other opportunity that exists for people is selling DPF filters or being a reseller for them. So the other opportunity for fleets especially is buying aftermarket versus OEM. So traditionally OEMs, they buy something, they sell you a reman. Reman in the traditional sense is disassembling it. I think of a brake shoe. I got a core, I remove the lining, I take out all the old rivets, I then sandblast that core, that metal piece down, I repaint it, I then put a new lining on it, new rivets, and I resell that, that brake shoe as a reman. With DPF filters, that does not happen. They do not disassemble any piece of a DPF or dock whatsoever. They simply clean them and put them back into circulation and sell them as a reman. So when you buy a reman DPF from an OEM dealer, you are getting a DPF where you have no idea what the history is, you have no idea the longevity of it is, or the reliability of it. It could be someone that's gone through three, four, five, six trucks and who knows what kind of situations. So what I'm saying is, you can buy aftermarket a lot of times cheaper or at the same price as an OEM, have no core charges, and know you're getting a brand new item with a great warranty on it. It's something to strongly look at and consider. So well, let's get off the after treatment. I think I hopefully gave you enough ideas and suggestions there on why you should get involved with after treatment diagnostics and repairs. Let's talk about another one and that's called ADAS, all right? So what does ADAS stand for? You're gonna see more and more of this terminology, advanced driver assist systems. So examples of what that includes is things like forward collision warnings, lane departure warnings, automatic braking. All those safety systems that are using today's technology to really get in there and see what's going on and being a little proactive in the truck and taking over control of the truck to do audible alarms, do even measures such as automatically braking for you or whatever it may be. So where are we at with ADAS and, and why is it? Why am I talking about it? I'm talking about it because it's becoming more and more popular. In Europe, um, and they are ahead of us in this one when it comes to safety, is in 2016, they required it for all commercial trucks. So what's happened then is companies that play on both sides of the pond, like Volvo, like Freightliner, since they're owned by Daimler Chrysler, they are already doing a lot of this stuff in their trucks and pushing that technology towards the North American market. So for example, in 2018, Volvo made all of their over the road trucks standard to have these ADAS systems on them. Now the dealer, when he builds that truck and specs it for a customer stock, he can remove it, but it does come standard as default on every truck in those applications. In 2000, in 2000, I'm sorry, in last year, they, Volvo announced that 40% of all their line haul trucks now had ADAS equipment on them. Freightliner is not far behind and other equipment manufacturers are as well. And there's really only three companies you need to be aware of when it comes to ADAS. That would be Bendix with their wingman system. It'd be Meritor with their on-guard system. And then Daimler Chrysler with the Detroit Assurance system. 
So the reason I'm bringing all this up is again, as it presents opportunities to you as a shop owner or a fleet manager, you need to be aware of a couple of things. Number one, inspections were required at certain inter maintenance intervals. So if you're working on a truck or a customer's truck or your truck, there are certain time periods that are required for you to do certain maintenance and calibrations on those systems. The other one is that calibrations are often required, but they're not done that often. So for example, some of these systems, if you do such um, smaller tasks as change a tire, make suspension replacement repairs, steering system components are replaced or repaired, you do a wheel alignment on them, there are calibrations that are required to happen on those systems that oftentimes people don't know. And you need the proper diagnostic tools in order to do those things. There's aftermarket solutions and there's OEM solutions when it comes to that. So the reason I bring this all up is one from a liability point of stand view. You do not want to be the repair shop that does some maintenance or repairs on a customer's truck and then it goes out on the road and there is an accident that occurs and have some attorney come pull you up on the stand and ask you why you didn't do certain repairs that were required to by the OEMs or by the manuals. And then I can tell you being ignorant of a law or ignorant of a maintenance procedure is no excuse when it comes to pointing the blame and finger at somebody. You do not want to be tied up in any kind of legal, legal litigation. The second thing I want to say is that again, this goes to the point where you need to be the maintenance expert for your customer. Those that educate their customers and take care of their customers, those are the people that have long-term customers, they have loyal customers, those are not the customers that are leaving them because Joe's truck repair down the street is going to do something $5 cheaper. They are willing to pay for that knowledge. They're willing to pay for that peace of mind and know that their equipment's being maintained and their, minim their downtime is minimized. So I'm going to wrap it all up by saying this, that you are at a fork in the road if you are running a repair shop or you are a fleet or even have a mobile maintenance, you need to get ahead of the curve. You know it's coming. You know all these things are going to be coming your way. Where are the opportunities? I just outlined some of them. There are more out there. There are resources available. I get it. There's not been historically a lot of places available for training and help and support. We provide those. Other companies do as well. Search out those. Invest in your employees. Invest in your company so that you're around for the future. You need to get good at electrical diagnostics. You need to get good at after treatment. And you need to get good at ADAS. So with all that said, I really appreciate everyone's time for listening to this, this presentation. It's been great talking to everybody. Um, if you need to reach us, diesellaptops.com. And let me just say this, it's just not diagnostics, it's diagnostics done right. Thank you very much for watching.